thank you very much. And um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'll just say that, so Luke mentioned, Luke, you're already laughing. I haven't said anything yet. Uh, so uh, at, at, at the beginning, Luke mentioned, you know, several categories in which uh, people benefited from, from OFA, and I would say I like fall into several of those categories. Um, I might kind of tell some stories at the end. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, <coughs> some <coughs> questions around Hilbert's 13th problem and their connection to the moduli of abelian varieties. And this is joint work with Benson Farb and Jesse Wolfson. Uh, you might say, <laughs> so this, is, this is Benson here. This is Benson. You know, I make the remark that when I have the graduate, graduate students coming in, they seem to know more and more. And the reason is they start earlier and earlier. The, uh, this is not Jesse. This is Jesse's son, Leo. Um, <coughs> Okay, so what is what are the what what kind of question do I want to consider? Um, so if you take variety over an algebraic closed field of characteristic zero, and let's con just consider a connected finite atoll cover of this variety, and we're interested in some sense in the geometric complexity of y over x, and what I mean by this, and I, I want to ask myself, kind of what is the smallest uh, the smallest dimension? such that this cover comes from a pullback of, uh, of something of um, that small dimension. So we define the essential dimension of the cover to be the smallest integer such that there's a dense open u and x and a map u to some u prime such that, first of all, u prime has dimension e and y comes from the pullback of uh, a covering, u prime over e prime, <laughs> some finite atoll covering. <laughs> and let me just say here, um, the fact that in this definition you're allowed to take some uh, dense open is absolutely crucial. So um, that's something to keep in mind. A lot of these questions become much easier if you just insist that u is equal to x, but we don't want to do this here. And maybe the reason, I mean, the reason will maybe become clear a little bit later on. Then there's a second uh, kind of uh, definition where we also allow uh, composites of such coverings. So what do I mean? So the second definition, resolvent degree, uh, where I have the same thing, I have a, a covering, and then I want to consider the smallest integer such that there's a dense open and a tower of coverings over the dense open such that each of them has essential dimension less than or equal to R. So each one of these comes from something of smaller May, well, possibly smaller dimension. R, can be, is, R might be the dimension of X. And also, the co at the top, I, I dominate the covering that I started with. Okay? And of course, everything is connected. Everything is... Well, I assume that Y over X is connected, right? Otherwise, I think... I, from the beginning, don't, because of the original question about the empty set, certainly then <laughs> that determinates. Well, you don't want so you should better assume that they are finite. Oh, you mean that they, they should be non-empty if they're finite at all, but they could be empty. I think a finite is like <laughs> finite is being subjective, but yes, okay, let's. Just uh, <laughs> uh, for uh, connected and for completeness, we uh, say that connected here means also non-empty. Yes, uh, not like in Hubbard really. <laughs> <laughs> Already, the talk became empty within you know, in a few minutes. Okay. So, okay, so here we have the definition again of resolvent degree. So there are two notions, again, right? One is like for the individual uh, covering, whether it comes from something of small dimension, and then you have like towers, okay? And then there's a notion of, uh, for a group, just for a finite group, you can define essential dimension res and resolvent degree of the group as the soup over all coverings, y over x, such that the Galois closure has group G. This is for in a fixed characteristic. I'm in characteristic zero. My ah. k was characteristic zero. Ah, okay. Okay. So later on, I'll use some arguments right at the end in mixed characteristic. But for now, it, most of the talk, k will be in characteristic. The, the question is in characteristic zero. Um, 
Okay, so we're up to here. Um, okay, so we have this definition. So in fact, it turns out this notion of a central dimension resolvent degree, if you have a covering, it's the same for the covering or for its normal closure. So it's kind of invariant to that. So this is for, for a group G. But uh, notice that when you reduce the field of definition, you don't say that the G... What field? Ah, okay, when you take the G... It doesn't mean that the, the, the G torso... If you take a G torso over a variety, it doesn't yeah. mean that, gene that generically it comes from a G torso over... Yes, you have to prove that, though. It's true. It's true. You mean, the que are you asking just if you have a covering, but now it has some extra structure, like it's a G-toss? So because suppose you have a G-toss, yeah. so certainly the Galois closure has group G. Yeah. Okay? So your definition is that you can reduce the field of definition to a subfield of transcendence degree E. Yeah. Okay, but just as a finite tall cover. Not, not as a G-tosser. Not, and of course... Yes, uh, but... but, but it's the argue, but but yes, the exactly. Yes. 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 It's the same. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Did everyone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Ofer's question, I mean, which we're going to sweep under the rug, is here I'm just, when you have a covering, I, 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 the question is about reducing it to smaller dimension, but as a covering. But maybe it has some extra structure. Maybe it's a local system or a G tosser, and maybe you want to reduce. Uh, the dimension with that structure, in fact, it turns out that it's equivalent to that. But that's a little lemma, which took me sli a little bit longer to prove than <laughs> it took over. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all right. Uh, so these definitions are due to, uh, of a resolvent degree, are due to Brouwer, Shimura, Arnold, and for essential dimension, are due to Bühler, Reichstein. Uh, but in fact, they formalize a circle of questions going back to Hamilton, Hilbert, and others. Actually, as, as you'll see, like, this subject is a very strange subject because, you know, usually you have, like, one definition and then the second definition using the first one comes after that in time. Or maybe you have, like, a conjecture and then the theorem gets proved after the conjecture. In this subject, everything is kind of in the opposite order, you'll see. So, for example, here, uh, sorry, I forgot. Here, the definition of resolvent degree was formalized by Br Shimura, Arnold, and Brouwer, and the definition of essential dimension was given later by Bill and Reichstein. I mean, they gave it in a kind of more general context. Okay. Uh, so let's look at an example. This was the classical, one of the classical examples that was of interest to Hilbert. So let's look at the space of monic separable polynomials of a degree n. So it's given by affine space and n minus 1 <laughs> coordinates, just given by the coefficients minus the discriminant locus. And this has a covering where I look at the solution of the polynomial, right? So you have f as a, a, a polynomial, and then z as a solution of the polynomial. So this gives a covering. Um, and well, the essential dimension of this covering is the dimension. Of course, this, is a, this covering, its normal closure, has Galois group Sn. Um, and it's kind of the generic SN covering. So its essential dimension is the essential dimension of the group. Same for resolvent degree. And notice here, this is going to be kind of one of the rules of the game. The resolvent degree of SN, in fact, it turns out to be the same as the resolvent degree of AN because uh, this is just an index to a subgroup. And as we'll see in a second, uh, when I have a, a cover of degree two, I can always kind of reduce it to uh, oh, something one dimensional. <laughs> so I'll, I mean, that's kind of easy, but I'll mention it in a second. Uh, so what is known about the resolvent degree? So for n equals 1, it's due to the Babylonians that this is uh, equal to 1. This is the paper. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sorry? Can I enlarge it? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a, um, I, of course I can't literally, if I try to do it now, it'll be a disaster. But... Uh, I'm not sure that the ideas that you use for the... In the formulation of yeah. the notion, like you have to speak about algebraically closed field, yeah, and, uh, yeah, so all the notion of even negative numbers, or yeah. Or <laughs> or <laughs> or <laughs> or <laughs> I, but I already mentioned earlier, Ufa, that in the subject everything is like in reverse order. So it's true that the Babylonians didn't know what a finite total cover was, ne nevertheless, they had proved this theorem, as you can see, because the paper is right here. Right? So the point is that um, 
when uh, n equals, oh, uh, sorry, did I mean n equals 1? I meant n equals 2. n equals 1 is not, is not, is not so interesting. Sorry, n equals 1 is not so interesting. <laughs> sorry, that's a typo, n equals 2. n equals 2. If you look at separable polynomials of degree n, yes. monic, then they depend on n parameters. No, 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 monic. Monic. Yes. No, no, monic, but you can delete, you can, um, you can get rid of one. Uh, we're not doing that. Yes, but we're not doing that. Yeah. It should no, be, no, like then it should be n. Then it should be n because you have. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I knew there would be some typos here. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, that's fine. Okay, so this should be an n. Anyway, so this should be n equals 2. That's terrible. Okay, so, uh, but let, so, th so the point is you have a quadratic formula, right? So if you have a covering of degree 2, uh, then you know that this is basically given by extracting the square root, okay? And which means, and then this function f gives you uh, a map to gm, and so then this comes just from this multiplication by, de by degree 2. That's the result of the Babylonians. Uh, okay. And then for n equals 3 and 4, you have a similar thing um, uh, by kind of, there was this classical problem of solutions of polynomials of some degree, uh, whether it could be solved in radicals. So you have um, Tataglia, Cardano, and <laughs> Ferrari uh, solve this in degree 3 and 4. Notice there, you, in the formula, you have to kind of compose functions, right? Because you have to take a sequence of radicals. Um, okay. And then for n equals 5, there's a result of Bring from 1786 that it's still equal to 1. So the point there is after you extract some roots, for example, a square root of the discriminant, I think there are also some other things, you can bring the polynomial into fifth degree polynomial into this form. So you, you kind of only have one parameter. Okay. Uh, and then, well, Hilbert was interested in this kind of question. He conjectured that for n greater or equal to 6, the resolvent degree was greater or equal to 2, and in particular for small values, he had computed and he made some uh, conjectures for small values. So if n equals 6 is 2, n equals 7 is 3, this is the one that has to do with, if you look in literally the 13th problem of Hilbert and the ICM address, it has to do with n equals 7. Um, and then uh, it's 4 if n equals 8 and 9. And one thing is he had already shown an upper bound in these small cases. He checked that, uh, that the resolvent degree was at most this value in each of these cases, in particular in the case of 9, the fact that 9 is the same as 8. Um, as a slightly tricky argument. You mean there is an argument showing that the answer for 8 is equal to the answer for 9? Well, yes, but... But with the a, I, with the answer, f no, no, no. I don't know if, yeah, that I, I don't know if that's true. Maybe, um, I mean, he he just got an upper bound. Okay. So, and the, and the and the lower bound is proven. Uh, no, th this is a conjecture. Oh, conjecture. Conjecture. Okay. Ah, it's part of the conjecture. So the statement is still. This is still. The the sorry, the whole thing is a conjecture. Yeah. Isn't I mean you can see that from the types of LaTeX typesetting. See, it's like all conjecture. <laughs> Okay? And here's a remarkable fact. There are actually no examples of covers which you where you've it's, pr prov it's proved that the, the resolvent degree is bigger than 1. So for essential dimension, that's not the case. There are, you can do something for essential dimension. There are non-trivial upper bounds for a resolvent degree. So this is going to be one of those theorems where everything happens backwards, okay? So there's a theorem which due to Hamilton that if you look at the resolvent degree of this cover for this solutions of the polynomials, um, then, well, of course, this is at most <laughs> n, okay? Uh, in fact, you can do better than that. But what, they, what he showed is that if you take any positive integer r, then there's some h of r such that, oops, okay. 
such that n, for n bigger than h of r, you have this. Okay, sorry about the typos. It's unfortunate, you can't kind of go off there with a the chalk and correct it. Okay, so basically, for if you t so if you fix r and n is big, then you kind of can improve the bound, okay? But in Hamilton, this, this h of r grows incredibly quickly. And then this result of Hamilton was forgotten. It was conjectured by Segre in 1947. <laughs> and it was reproved by Brower in 1975. <laughs> and this is Hamilton and Brower. But again, the, yeah. in the days of Hamilton, I believe that things were, the notions were a more primitive. That's right. And I'm going to explain what the primitive notions are. So <coughs> I kind of deliberately, I mean, I introduced it this way, maybe for my benefit, because I always get confused with the, the primitive notions. I'm going to you try to, to share that with us. sorry, what was that? And you want to share that with us. Well, I, <laughs> I will in a second, but before I confuse you, I will, t you know, I'm going to tell you how I think about it. So. Well, also how, say, Brower thought about it. Okay, so here's the historical interlude. This is the question, how did they think about it? Okay, so they thought about this invariant in terms of whether if you had, say, a solution of a general polynomial of a degree n, uh, it could be expressed in terms of a composite of functions of r variables where r is less than n. Okay, so let's try to translate this into that notion. Okay, so if you have a cover, let's first try to think about this, the notion of a central dimension in that kind of setup. So if you have a, co uh, a finite cover, and let's assume we've already kind of replaced x by this open, okay? Uh, so let's consider first a section of this cover. Now this cover we, we thought of as connected. So of course there's no literal section, but you can think of this section as either kind of be, being a multi-valued function or maybe it's defined locally, okay? And let's suppose now that this y to x comes from some y prime mapping to x prime with the dimension of x prime less than dimension of x, okay? then you can choose, I mean, so y is the fiber product of y prime and x, so of x prime. So you can actually choose a section here, and then this guy comes from here. And then f is a function, it's really determined by f prime, so if you think about what's going on here, it means that f is a function and this number of variables, if you think of some local coordinates here. Of course, when you, you can also think about this question, let us say, in terms of real or complex analysis, just take functions in the, in, in the classical neighborhood, yes. whether it is a composite just of analytic functions. That's right, yes. And this is uh, something which doesn't require to have this algebraic. That's right, yes. I'm, I'll get to that too. Okay. There, I mean, there are, ma there are many variants of this question, um, depending on the kind of functions you use. Okay? Uh, so there's a function in this number of variables. That's how you think of f. Okay, so there's our diagram. And now let's think about the situation of a, a composite. So if you have a tower like this, and each one of these has essential dimension equal to r, say, then you choose sections like this. And then if you think about what's going on, then this composite section is a composite of these functions, these sections, and each one of them has uh, variables. So, uh, so this, is a, this kind of section is given by a function in r variables. Okay. And so what Hilbert actually asked about in, in the 13th problem is he discusses, I mean Hilbert, I should say Hilbert has, um, he wrote about this question in other places. So the, this thing about, I think, algebraic solutions is what he was interested in. But what he wrote in the 13th problem, he asked whether this was equal to 3, and in particular he asked whether you could just show this in, um, in uh, kind of a, a naive way, namely, whether if you have, uh, we have a function in, um, sorry, so you have this general equation of degree seven, okay, and you have the, you have a solution, and whether it could be written as a composite of function in functions in less than or equal to two variables, even locally, even at the level of continuous functions. So locally means, I mean, we're, we're over P7, which is, let's think of it as a complex variety, but you can, ha you just look at a little region, which is a little cube, and you ask yourself, so there you have a solution, and you ask yourself, can you even write it there in that way? But uh, it's not zero one, zero one is more like uh, in Rm. No, I, right, so I mean, well, it's complex manifold, so it's a real manifold. M is, 
times yeah. seven. M has a particular value, that's right. <laughs> that's true. But M is 14. <laughs> no, but if the functions are to be analytic or real. <laughs> well, he, in his thing, I mean, the, he discusses actually different kinds of functions. Namely? Well, continuous ones are one of them. One, ca one class of function. He works as in a real domain or, or in the complex domain? It's not so... I mean, I think at one point he's asking this question, where he's just asking about continuous functions. But then he would work with uh, real polynomials or complex polynomials? Well, that I don't quite understand. I mean, you have, like, you have this set up, right? So if, if I restrict to a cube in here, I can ask whether I have this solution function, I can write it as a composite of continuous functions or not, for example. Yeah, but when you use real variables, you have twice as many variables, so it's not... Um, and how to formulate the question with the word variables when you work, when you change complex variables to... Yeah, so no, so, right, so I think you have to think of it as, as, re, as 14 real variables, I guess, right? But then you want, <laughs> you want to know, it's not possible to write as a complex function in most two variables, but in the sense of complex variables, not in the sense of real variables. Or maybe it's... They're it just, con they're continuous functions that he's asking about. So I don't. Well, okay, we don't have here the text yeah. of the. No, no, he's really asked about. I mean, he asked it also for analytic functions, but let me just. Okay. Could not be. Yes, he asked. He asked to show that it can't can't be written Could that way. Be. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe here it's here it's ambiguous if I if I don't specify the kind of functions, <coughs> but he's let's say he's asking about continuous functions here. Um, so this is what Arnold and Kolmogorov proved could be done. So they proved that if you have any continuous function on a cube, it's a composite of continuous functions, a one variable. In fact, this is a more precise statement. Yeah. And now you might be a little confused because if you're thinking about it classically like this, in terms of these coverings, then of course, if you restrict the covering to a cube, it will be a trivial covering. So what is left to do? Well, the point is that if you're thinking about solutions of your polynomial, you have really not just a covering, but also an embedding into the affine line. So it's really this structure that kind of you have to reduce. So, all, so, if, you so if you restrict to a cube, then kind of um, this covering structure disappears and you just have this function left. And of course, in the other formulation, you don't you don't care about this. So it turns out in the algebraic setting uh, in which I formulated the problem, this kind of choice of primitive root doesn't, doesn't change the problem either. So in, in some sense, this is kind of orthogonal to, to the other way, question. So if, just a little translation of the question. Yeah. So if you can reduce the covering to covering of things of dimension at most e. Uh -huh. If you want to think about the multi-valued solution functions, then essentially you will have to, <coughs> to follow this, but then you will have to apply some algebraic morphism, which means polynomials. And so yes. you will have to use polynomial, and this yeah. polynomial is, is like you have addition and multiplication right. functions of two variables. Yes, that's so right. You lose the one. No, no, that's right. So, so, so there's a question here, which is when you're, when you're, uh, sorry, when you're, um, adding and multiplying, that's strictly speaking a function of two variables, okay? But, if, but for us, we kind of, that's allowed for free, okay? So it's true, in fact, it's, if you want to get into the history, you might wonder why did Hilbert consider seven here, given that he didn't even know the answer for six? And one reason could be that he wanted just a clean formulation like this, and since you always have to have at least two variables, this was kind of the first case where you have a non-trivial bound if you allow to if you allow the stupid two variables where you have addition and multiplication right okay. okay happy all right okay so that's the end of the historical interlude so here are some examples from geometry and classical examples uh, so let h33 be the moduli space of cubic surfaces in b3 modulo the action of pgl4 so this is a four-dimensional space and then we're going to consider the kind of, so if you have a, a cubic surface in P3, it's uh, 
a kind of classical fact that if you look at lions in P3, which lie on the surface, there are 27 of them. So this is meant to be a picture. And uh, so you can consider the such, such lines, right? So this is a 27-sheeted cover. Okay, so every point here you have the 27 lines. And its group is the vial group of E6. Uh, so, I mean, it has to be a subgroup of S27, and it's the vial group of E6. And so when I say it has its group W of E6, what I mean is the, the, the normal closure has the scalar group. And the conjecture is that the resolvent degree of this covering is 3. And there's a theorem of uh, Burkhart and Klein, which says that it's at most, it's less than or equal to 3. Klein is I think so. It's the guy who worked on this kind of geometry. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess. Anyway, so you can so there's a reduction of the dimension by one here. This is four dimensional. <coughs> okay. And uh, then there's another kind of famous classical example where you have smooth cortex in P2 modulo the action of PGL3, this has dimension 6, and then you can consider, for each such cortic, you can consider lines in P2 which are tangent to the cortic at two points, so called bitangent. Okay, and this is a 28, there are 28 such lines, so there's a 28 sheeted cover, and the group of the normal closure is the vial group E7 living inside S28, and it's conjectured that the resolvent degree here is 6. And so one thing that I want to explain is how to reduce all these, try to reduce these questions to another kind of covering where maybe one feels one has more techniques, which is the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties. So let's consider AG, the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties. Uh, and if I, for any prime P, I can look at the, the, P, the P torsion of the universal family. Okay. So then this group, this covering has group SP2 GFP. And so here's a proposition which reduces the resolvent degree of these coverings from classical geometry to this setup. Uh, in fact, there are two. So you see, you have to concentrate here because it's G is the genus and then P is the prime. So here I have 2, 3 and here I have 3, 2. Okay. So this is reducing the resolvent degree, uh, in this case, to the resolvent degree of the kind of the three covering of the, of the universal family of abelian surfaces. And here I have the two covering for abelian threefolds for the bitangent problem. Okay, so let me let me kind of try sketch the proof of this. The point is that the two groups in this case are related. So let's just do the first one. Here the covering is the vial group of E6. This is a degree two subgroup which is nearly isomorphic to SP4F3. It's PS. Yep. When you define the resolvent degree yep. for the covering again you you had some connectedness assumption, but of course the p-torsion is not connected because of the zero section. Right. So uh, essentially you you have to take soup of all connected components, but just here maybe you yes. do, everything is connected except for the zero section. Right. Yeah, yeah. Section right. Connected. The thing you care about is, is kind of the, the um, <coughs> yeah, I mean the thing which is giving you kind of the monodromy. The, Right, I guess, I mean, yeah, that's right, you, it's, it's the thing minus the zero section, if you like, but. Uh, is it also the moduli space is the coarse moduli space, yes? Yeah, that's right. So I'm here, I'm ignoring, yes, yeah, so you should add some level structure away from P that doesn't matter. You have minus one automorphism, so you don't have a yeah. universal family. No, let, sure. no, no, don't worry about that. Yeah. You should, you just add, I mean, I wrote AG, <laughs> Okay, but you just add some level structure. And, uh, That's not going to change anything. Is it essentially independent yes. of, the, yes. of the which level structure prime? Right. Yes. Yes. 
Okay, and we know that the monodromy then will be the full SP. Right. Okay. Uh huh. So let's, yes, yeah, so we're doing the first one. So remember here, the monitor group was WV6, the Baal group V6. This has an index two subgroup, which is nearly SP of F3. So the covering group here, right, for this is, this is for genus two. So this would be SP4 of F3, okay. But we already saw that the resolvent degree is kind of insensitive to quadratic extensions. So that, so that means the groups on these two sides are related. <coughs> and in fact, what you show is that both these families are versal. So you can imagine for any group G, there's a notion of a kind of a versal, fam a versal G cover. It's one which is kind of general enough that any other one comes from pullback from it. So for example, for our families of polynomials, that's a versal SN cover. Um, and for the other one, there's a similar versality argument, and the group theory looks like this. Again, there's an index two subgroup, which is actually sp6 of f2. Okay. So at least for me, this is this is kind of uh, motivating because um, I think for AG, what you would expect is there's no reason for this resolvent degree in general to be any smaller than the dimension of AG. And that's what we conjecture. There's one exception when G is 2 and P is 2. And that's because in that case, the group SP2G, so the, 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 in that case, the group SP2G FP, namely SP4 F2, is not simple. It has an index 2 subgroup. And that allows you to, to reduce, that, that means you can pass to that quadratic cover for free, and that allows you to reduce the resolvent degree by one. So in that case, when G is two, uh, so if G is two, this number here is three, but in fact, the, you'd see, you can show that the resolvent degree of that cover is at most two in that exceptional case. But I think otherwise, there's no reason to believe that this is any smaller than the dimension of AG. Oh, sorry, that's the remark. To yes. add an extra level structure. Yeah. So this conjecture is... Yes, for any... For any such choice, yeah, but you right. don't... But is it possible to define this in the sense of stacks also? Or, or Probably. Yeah. Okay, but they are not... Okay. But I have the feeling that's like not the main point. Okay, no, but, <laughs> but because... Uh, it's true that it's not obvious that this is... If I add a level structure... Yeah which is prime to P, it's not obvious that this is independent yeah, of P. Sure, yeah, right, uh, right. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so one thing is that this agrees with the conjectures in this case for the two classical problems. So remember, in this case, we said it should be three, okay? And then we related this one to, um, which one did we relate it to? Uh, so I meant to get three. How am I meant to get three? Uh, sorry. A2, that's right, A2, three. Oh yeah, yeah, right, that's right, sorry, that's right. No, I was confused because G was two. And so I was still thinking about this example, but then P is three, right? Yeah, good. So. Uh, so in that case, right, so the dimension of A2 will be 3, and we're conjecturing a 3 here. And then uh, in the other case, it's A3, 2, which means the dimension will be 3 times 4 on 2, so it should be 6. SP2 of F2 also has uh, numbers of index 2. SP4? Two. Yeah, I guess, but... But you don't want to SP4 of what? We're not even, cons yeah, okay, I should, uh, well, let's see, if G, you mean if G is 1? If G is 1, I get 1. So that seems to be correct. Yeah. It can't be any smaller than that. So. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, so at the moment, we prove this at the level of a central dimension. Uh, so the... If I take this covering, this is just the dimension of AG. So again, I take this covering, 
So the, I can't contract it to anything smaller. So that's what you would guess. And I'll sketch a proof of that at the end. In fact, there's a generalization of this. Uh, so <coughs> to explain this, let me take for P the, um, the Siegel parabolic in SP2GFP. So in the standard representation, it just corresponds to upper triangular matrices, which are in the symplectic group. And let U be its unipotent radical. So the, the, uh, the structure of U, it's an abelian unipotent group, and it's just its rank is equal to the dimension of AG. And then if I have any group in here, I can take its intersection with U. <coughs> and I'm going to denote by EG the FP rank of this intersection. Okay, so it's something. Okay, and then what I can do is I can start with the Galois closure of this guy. Okay, and I take the I take the the the, the, um, the quotient corresponding to the group G. Okay. So, oh, sorry. So uh, so then this this covering has group G here from from this A G tilde to A G. And the statement is that central dimension is at least EG. Okay, so when G is the whole group, then AG is of course, then AG, a big G, is of course equal to a little g. And this is just the other proposition. It says, just says that the, the central dimension is equal to the rank of U, which is the just the dimension of AG. Okay, so let's apply this to the problem we were interested in from before with alternating groups. Uh, <coughs> so for this, I need the following uh, proposition. So it turns out there's a family of, in characteristic two, there's a uh, family of representations of AN, uh, which I won't describe, uh, but what the property it has is that if I intersect it with this, with this U, then this is in fact the maximal elementary abelian two subgroup of AN, meaning the one of maximal rank. And there's a formula, a simple formula for it, it's two, two times the integer part of N over four. And so in particular, we get, uh, yeah, we get an estimate for this AN cover here, for the essential dimension. Um, this is just a remark that these coverings here uh, turn out to be versal when n is 5 and 6, but probably not in general. So vers again, versal means that they're kind of the most generic kind of coverings. And so one thing is that kind of in the literature, there, are, there were methods for computing the essential dimension of versal coverings in this case, but in general, these are probably not versal, so it's kind of a new, re new result to be able to compute their essential dimension. <laughs> so in the literature, I guess people uh, have already worked on this for a, like the essential dimension of A. So the essential dimension of A M. Yes. Do they know it. I don't know if they know it. There's some lower bounds. Okay. So yeah, yeah. this is compatible with. <coughs> the so it better be. <laughs> <laughs> but you, that is it exactly the previous result, or you are improved. Uh, you mean you mean does the bound is is the bound that they got just this bound somehow? Yeah. Um, that I'm not sure. I mean I know how to compute the. I know. Th I know how to compute a lower bound for the central dimension of a n. It's by obtained by computing what computing what's called the something else, which is the um, called the central p dimension, which is less than or equal to the essential dimension. And that can be like using a result from Mercuriev that can be deduced purely by group theory. But we haven't actually done that calculation. So you have to kind of look at the, um, I think you have to look at like the smallest, something like the smallest complex representation of the p Cielo subgroup of, of AN. You look at the, the dimension of that guy. Yes, right. Maybe even, um, sorry, 
Yeah, maybe you need to look at the dimension of the smallest faithful one or something like that. Anyway, so for these covers, you have this estimate. And so let's look at these, the first, let's look at the first, uh, the values of the first, the first few values of this EAN. Well, it's a very simple function, so you can write it down mm. here. Okay. And let's compare this with Hilbert's conjectured value for the result, resolvent degree of the sky. Okay. Well, we know for four and five, it actually should be one, so let's forget about that. Okay. And then for the other values, you see that this is nearly the bound that, that uh, he conjectured for resolvent degree, namely for resolvent degree, he conjectured two, three, four, and four. So only in seven, it's kind of off by one. Um, okay. And so the, con the conjecture is actually for n greater or equal six, you have, this is also a bound for the resolvent degree of, the, of, the, of that cover. And so particular it would be a bound for the resolvent, lower bound for the resolvent degree of an itself. So, so we have some kind of progress towards this, but it's still open. Uh, right, so this would imply the conjecture for 6, 8, 9. And the conjectures on cubics and bitangents that, that I explained before. Okay, so let me, to end, let me sketch a proof of how you show this bound on the essential dimension. Um, ah. This should be a capital G. Okay. The reason I put a small g was psychological because I want to restrict immediately to this case. Okay. So the general case is kind of similar, but okay. So we want to show that the essential dimension of this covering is just equal to the rank of this uh, maximal unipotent, which is the dimension of a g. And uh, well, the idea is if this covering comes from something of smaller dimension, let's, let's say AG mapping to V. So first of all, this has some integral, nice integral model, and then I can make an integral model of, of V over OK, where now I switch, so K was algebraically closed before, but now I'm going to switch settings and assume K over QP is finite. So there's some kind of specialization argument that allows you to do that. Um, Okay, so this is now an integral thing. And then um, what you actually want to do is pass to the piatic completion and then over then this AG twiddle that I had before, this was kind of this FP local system. Uh, so now, but now we're working integrally, right? So before I had this AGP twiddle without the circle, it was this FP local system whose monodromy was the symplectic group, SP2GFP, right? But now uh, I put a circle there that means that even characteristic, if I want to extend in characteristic P, it doesn't extend as an ATAR local system, but it extends as a finite flat group scheme, okay? And what you, what you show is that actually you can choose this V hat zero so that this descends to V hat zero at least on some formal open in, ordin in the ordinary locus of this guy. Right. In any case, when you're doing essential dimension, you in any case have to restrict to an, you have to allow yourself to restrict to an open. So this is no, not really, I mean, in some sense, this is cost free in terms of what you're trying to prove. Okay. So you descend not just the local system, but in fact, the whole finite flat group scheme. <coughs> and now you think about the deformation theory of these finite flat group schemes. So <coughs> if you take any if any closed point in the ordinary locus, um, <coughs> then in characteristic P, so this is a well, closed point, then you can think about in any tangent direction, if you go in any tangent direction, this gives you a deformation of this, the, the uh, fiber of this finite flat cruise scheme at X. <coughs> okay, so let's just say over the dual numbers. And then it follows, well, either from Sertate theory or growth ending messing theory, or the Sertate theory works better for the for the generalization to an arbitrary G, uh, <coughs> that in any, in any tangent direction, you get a non-trivial deformation, and that in some sense, um, well, there's no redundancy, kind of, if you go, this gives you, this gives you, a, every direction gives you a different uh, deformation. 
And then the point is we get a contradiction because it if, you, if this comes by pullback from some, some, something of smaller dimension, you can't get enough deformations. <coughs> okay. Of this guy or that guy? But how do you know that the integral model exists over P? Which one? Of? Of. If it comes from something of smaller dimension. This V? Yeah, but then how do you get an integral model including P? Of, of this one? Yes. You just, I mean, remember we're always allowed here to restrict to an open. Yes. So the, this, I mean, we can assume this is affine. Yeah. And I can just take the interse intersection of the rings. Okay, and then you have to do a little bit more, like here when you show it descends, you can always replace, you replace something by its normalization in here as well. And then you can descend the finite flat group scheme. Uh, okay, this seems to be non trivial. Uh, you know that the uh, Essential. So this means generically, you know that the covering comes from V. Uh huh. But then the firefly group scheme structure is. Yeah. No, you have to. I don't claim this is completely obvious, but maybe <coughs> we can. I can explain it to you later, but. Which part are you worried about? The descent to V? Okay, okay, because the <coughs> you have a finite group scheme on the general fiber. Yeah. Which is the descent. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, it's not, it does not, uh, the models of finite extension to finite flat group scheme is yeah. not, uh, you know, it turns <coughs> up, but do you mean that you can descend, there is some descent datum yeah. on the. Basically, you, you do it by, I mean, if you restrict things enough. Yes. then this map is already flat. Yes. And then, um, I mean, in fact, we do this just in a formal neighborhood, but, but because all you, that's all you need. I mean, we're working on the ordinary locus here. So this is an extension of an atoll part by a multiplicative part, yes. right? And so each of those parts descend. And certainly in, the ordin in, in a formal neighborhood, because they're just kind of trivial. And then you have to compute the extension classes. And then you, s then you get that like any extension class. So basically, if, it, if you have an extension class that extends to a finite flat group scheme here, it already extends to a finite flat group scheme here. OK. OK, so that's the end of the talk, the <laughs> end of the official part of the talk. Um, and uh, <coughs> so, I, so I mentioned that uh, that I benefited from kind of Ofer's suggestions in uh, in a few ways. One story I wanted to tell was, I think it was now 15 or more years ago, I was giving a talk in, in Orsay. And um, after I afterwards, uh, well, I mean, I, at tea, I asked maybe Ofer a, a question. It was a, que a kind of group theoretical question about representations of fundamental groups of curves. And if you have such a thing where every simple closed curve had finite image, this imply that the representation finite image. Anyway, the talk was about something completely different. Afterwards, um, afterwards, uh, uh, Ofer and Luca Lucy and I went out for dinner. And then after kind of several glasses of uh, wine, Ofer came up with a counterexample. <laughs> and here is a picture of the <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the bottle of wine, the actual bottle of wine. And uh, <coughs> so, you know, when, when my co-authors and I was kind of struggling with some of these questions, I would sometimes say, this is exactly the kind of thing you should ask Ofer, perhaps over a nice bottle of wine. Okay, thank you. Thank you, a very important. So there's one compliment Luke told me at, when you asked the question at T, yeah. Sarah heard the question. <laughs> and you want to tell the whole story? I'll do it rapidly. So, Luke sent Sarah an email after the dinner telling him Ofer settled it. And 
So I had asked Sarah the question at T. Is yeah. the yeah. So then Sarah called Luke very early in the morning, earlier than Luke normally gets gets up. <laughs> and said, Gabit de Khan. And Luke said, this is unlikely. <laughs> Why don't you think about this a little more? <laughs> Sarah called back a little later, Gaba a razor. Any other story? <laughs> All questions about the talk are also, are also allowed. Talk, talk about Shimura Arnold. You wrote the names down. Right. So they have an article. Um, I forgot where it is. It's in the in the in the nineteen sixties, where they just asked this question. I think it's in some kind of proceedings, where the you know questions in algebra geometry are being discussed. What about MD? Yeah. What about it? I mean, yes, you can. So there it's even somehow more complicated, right? Because you have like the mapping class group. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, so, so implicitly you need some local kind of flattening model of because you are, you are working with, uh, uh, well, maybe it's not so difficult, but you want to, to pass on the characteristic zero situation to the final mm -hmm. schemes, you need some at least in the neighborhood of your uh, generic point of special fiber, so you have kind of the divisorial evaluation. I mean, mm -hmm. you need a good model for the map in terms of mm -hmm. something which is smooth between smooth things over the DDR. This, mm -hmm. this is okay. Mm -hmm. This is part of the argument. That yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, in the argument, it's not quite as... I think this is still okay like this, but... But this is, you see, you really only need it in a formal neighborhood of a, of a point. Yes, but yeah. you have to prepare things with yeah, yeah. the group things. Properly. Right, okay. yeah, sure. I mean, right. I don't want to just put the paper up. So. Okay. Have you learned a mistake? As long as possible. <laughs> Sorry? That's right. Fall into one of my categories. <laughs> so, some other questions? Yes. Um, did you look at the trial group of type E8 and the tri tangent plane with the six or did you stop at E7? We stopped at E7. Okay. So maybe we can thank the speaker again.